stamping my mark on earth Laughing on the road of life Dancing with the wind Emotions in and out like the tide Moving beyond the hurt Learning I don't need to run Unafraid of revealing These crazy feelings that come Challenge brought me to tears But I overcame my fears Day by day, life reappears Before my eyes Thriving So much more than surviving Welcome to Survivor to Thriver, a show where we hear some inspiring stories of locals who have overcome hardship in life to become thriving individuals. The goal of this show is to raise awareness about the variety of struggles that our locals have gone through and are going through and how they've turned those struggles into sources of personal growth and emotional strength. Today I'm with Demario Soa and he's going to share his story. I spent so much of my existence in America to make it so you don't know my childhood or you don't see what I've really seen or felt. I was born in an orphanage and I was taken away when I was a kid. I was um, put through different groups of camping and use of kids for different things. I don't know exactly what was going on politically, um, but I know what we were being told. There was not a glimpse of love, hope. You really learn the term living day by day. <laughs> when you're in that position, I'm telling you. you no, know, because the next meal could be your joy of the day. The next water break could be the joy of the day. The next place that you can find to sleep could be your joy of the day. Now, if you haven't been in that position, it's really hard for you to understand what I'm talking about. You have to reach a point that it's okay that people will not understand. We can all only empathize so far. You get into that healing point of this is who I am. This is something that will be there and I can't push it down. I have to keep it with me. And I have to realize that there are moments where I just have to acknowledge it. It's with me every day, so it's, it's who I am. I spent a lot of time running from it and not wanting to be it or wanting to present myself to be something else. All the good and the bad. If you look at my face, there's certain parts of it that has scars, certain parts of it that don't. But it all makes up to be the same face. I think if the past, if it helped in any way, I would say that it helped me stomach moments when, boy, you felt so alone. It, and it's so hard, seriously. I remember staying with this particular, particular woman that the last time before I was actually taken out of the camp. And I remember her name. Her name was Kat Katrin Tando. If you ask me one of the worst people that I've met or experienced anything with, you would think it would be with a warlord or a general or a sergeant. She's my biggest memory in my head. The lady, bef the person I was staying with before we were taken away. I mean. She was just evil to me, you know, vicious. I still remember that feeling that I wanted to leave. Like, I would have I gone with you if you came in and told me that you were gonna take care of me. 
You, and you know why, you know why she, I felt like that about her? There were fragments of love in our home, in the home that we stayed at, the camp. There were times when she favored people, like there were, or certain people got, you know, an opportunity to, to watch The Cosby Show, which was the only show we ever saw, and Tom and Jerry. And like certain ones like myself were deeply cast eyes, like, you know, we weren't fed, we weren't, we would just be slaved all day. So there were moments in her element, and then she was extremely abusive. Now that is very different from being around military forces and being around a situation where you know there's not gonna be any love. But when you're in a position where there's fragments of moment that sh strike at your heart, but you can't really have it. So she represents, now that I look back, she represented, see, when I got into the camp and I saw the military cars and the guns and the, okay, I wasn't expecting love. Do you understand what I'm saying? This was a situation where it was, looking back now I understand why, she, you know, because of one moment, it's like everyone will have something, you know, to eat. And like, you know, some groups, some, some of us are sitting in like a, like a cell, like, you know, and we have like very little. And like, like, and then right after that, you think you ate something and somehow in your, in your mind as a child, when you get the food, you'll feel like, oh, you don't, you don't, oh, you're, you like me, you, you fed me, you like me. That's what I, that's what you tell yourself. And then the next moment you're being thrown down the stairs with two metal bats. And the next, literally the next striking moment. That prepared me for, you know, you know, at that point when I had to go here and be a part of this group or make sure that we get home or go fetch water or go clean those weapons or do that. Those were, that was nothing to me. Cause though in that situation, I do that I know that we'll be fed three times a day, you know? And I know that under those conditions, if I wanted more food, I can fight, I can raise up in their ranks, I can, I can do things. With that woman, there was no, it was just, she just hated certain kids. There was no chance, you know? So my whole, I, fl I started to almost flourish in the camp, you know? And then when I think about it, if I was still there, I mean, I could have been, you know, because I was a pretty in intelligent kid, I feel, you know, uh, more than I am now. <laughs> and, you know, um, but um, it's funny because I've never explained it like this before. And really, so yeah, she represented that weird twisted love of, do you love me or do you hate me? And that was very early for me, you know? So then when these guys came along, I remember it was like such a, you know, people were, kid, other kids were panicking. It was tough, but it wasn't, tough, it wasn't that tough for me, you know? And, I, and it makes sense why it wasn't that tough for me. Because, you know what? You want me to make sure that all four of us get up before and go do this and do that and come back? Yeah, I could do that, sir. And guess what? I doubled my food. Oh, I doubled, oh, you, oh yeah, I have to beat up this kid? Oh, after we have to go after each other and I can, and I can rank up? I, I can be more important to you? Sure, I can do that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you grow up with that mentality and um, you eventually start clashing with, with knowing that you're doing things wrong. something floor like you know trains would go would run and I would think there was war it wasn't just coming back and r trying to reinsert yourself into society but it was also the culture shock of being in America in a new country so a lot of stuff was big 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 adjustment it really was but I landed in New York City I remember seeing the lights and that was really cool uh, and I remember telling myself, I can't wait to try milk. Because <laughs> I remember I used to see it on the Cosby Show and they would always have it in like a jar. And we would always wonder as, you know, kids, what is that thing? Because we would see people drinking all the time. We would wonder, what is that white thing? We just wanted to try it really hard. 
water. I remember one day describing this milk product to my mother and she pulled out this gallon and it was a gallon of milk. And I said, no, no, that's not it. And I said, no, I saw it in the jar, blah, 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 blah. So she went and she put it in the jar. <laughs> now that I look back at it, I'm like, man, she tricked me so simply. Just <laughs> she put it in the jar and she gave it to me. And I just like, literally I grabbed it and I just started drinking it. Then I like at least five seconds into it, I smashed it on the ground. Cause I was like, this has no taste. And I will never forget that moment because you have, to, you have to know something. You have, if you think about it, you understand what I'm saying. Imagine going up and seeing this milk poured on this Cosby show on a regular basis. I've never seen milk in Africa before. You know, I just didn't, at the time, I just had it. And plus, even if we had seen milk, the way that it was introduced on the show seemed like it was something else and much more delicious than when you actually try it and you're like, wait. Because you were thinking more like a caramelly, sweet flavor. So I went in there with that type of taste buds ready to, to taste this thing. So I smashed it on the ground. And um, yeah, so I hid in milk for a, for a while. And then I started liking it once I realized <laughs> it's uh, actually ingredients and purpose. When I came in, my mom spoke only English with me. She didn't want to speak African with me because she wanted me to fit in. Um, I had a bunch of fights in middle school, kids trying to pick on me. That didn't go too far for them, you know? But um, not that I'm some tough guy, man, but I'm also not gonna stand and get pummeled on. <laughs> That's my arena. <laughs> um, so, and you know, sometimes it's, it, you know, it's just like, you know, gangs and things like that. This is why I never, I had every perfect scenario to get into that stuff. But I felt like when I looked at the gangs here and the experiences back home and the brutality and the warfare and the reasons why we were doing what it was so much greater than you're wearing red and I'm wearing blue. And I don't like you because of that. It was like, for me, it was like, we were doing what we were doing for political reasons. These are the reasons why, these are the people that did stuff to your, to your parents. They're the reasons why you don't have your mom and your dad. You know, those were the condition and, and the understanding to which we behave. So none of those things here attracted me. I, f I felt like I was past it. I was playing with guns from the day I was born, from the beginning of time. So it never really attracted me that much. And I think that really helped me to, to not get in, involved into criminal elements now because I've seen so much death and chaos and how quickly you could be out of here. Now, quickly your life can change. And I feel like I've lost way too much, like really way too much to come this far and, you know, get into foolishness. So I never got into anything, you know, I don't get in trouble and things like that. Um, I don't have any legal issues, uh, um, just the normal stuff like anybody else. I'm a great dad. I have two lovely kids, uh, Reagan, she's my little princess, and Romeo, he plays basketball. Having those guys, man, just opened me up to a new level of vulnerability. It just slowed down my psyche, you know, made me think about things more. It made me feel what love is supposed to be. It made me feel like maybe I could still feel it if I can give it to them, you know. So they really became a driving force to where I'm at today. Um, they have to be my greatest accomplishment under very tr um, tough times. <laughs> but they are my greatest accomplishments. And um, my biggest goal and my first job, my most important thing on this earth is to always make sure that they are okay first as much as I can. You know, I never had that. So it feels good. But all I really want when people look at this or think of me is to feel like, man, I can do it too, you know? And because um, that's how I felt when I looked at certain people or listened to certain stories. You know, I would always listen to the, the wisdom behind what people are trying to say as much as I can. Like for example, there was a guy that, you know, we used to work for when we first came to this country, really wealthy guy, owned 
huge property. My friend and I went to work in his farm, and the minute my friend saw his farm and some of the finer things that this guy had, he was like, man, man, I wish I had your life. You know, I really, really do, sir. And, um, and the guy said, you know, if you have my life, you are going to want to return it back right away, believe me. And that always stuck with me as a kid. You know, my friend was like, I don't care, I still take it anyway. But in my mind, it represented something different. It represented the fact that it's not every, everything that you can see and, and touch. It's, we all have struggles. It doesn't mean that we have to look like we're, you know, you can have a dollar in your account. You still have to put on a decent shirt and pants, you know. <laughs> but, you know but because of that, it doesn't mean you don't have your own stories of struggle and, and stuff like that. So I try to grasp onto things like that growing up as a kid and trying to get ahead of my time. That's one of my main survival tools. I learned to be able to conversate and exchange with people that were ahead of me. I mean, when I got here two years later, my mom died from a car accident. You know, I, I was really, really messed up. <laughs> I was messed up, you know. So um, a lot of things were hitting me at once the minute I got here too. You know, hugs and affection and stuff like that was was really weird to me, and she wasn't full of it either. But I remember more publicly going to people's homes or engaging with people. Like people would want to go to dinner. Like you know, it was just all those things were very awkward for me. Um, major, major, major culture shock and PTSD. I feel like my spirit has done it all, and it's just exhausted, and it just wants to enjoyed a few good things that I've never had. There's a lot that I, I wasn't able to have access to growing up or feel, you know? Um, and sometimes what you're lacking feeling can be even harder than what you lack monetarily. Um, if you don't have resources monetarily growing up as a kid, hopefully you had the feeling that someone loved you or someone cared or you were valued. Um, I never had any of that, you know, having my kids and taking care of them and taking care of this and seeing what I bring to the world really shows me my value and adds and magnifies me to do it more. Um, so this is more than just something that I give to people. I guess it's also something that I give to myself. I wouldn't have gotten this far with playing a race card, so I'm not one of those type of folks. But I have experienced very, very uncomfortable moments and clear signs that some people viewed you as less and um, they were going to treat you as such. And I was never, never, never bred it to be able to tolerate that in any way, shape or form whatsoever. I would die for that part of who I am. I'm not looking to ever do that, but that's how I look at this. The very importance of your value being like mine and me realizing that I can't get anywhere without you and you can't get anywhere without me. And whatever it is, if it's good or bad, it's only a matter of time before it consumes us, us all. These are real conversations that should be had and, and it's okay to have them without feeling like someone's gonna think you are this or you're that. I love to learn. I still wanna definitely go to school all the way and I, if I have my way, I just keep going because I love continuing education. I'm obviously not as free as I was in the past to be able to push those limits. I wanted to make my mom proud, you know? I wanted to, I wanted to give her something. <laughs> you know? And it was, it was in hard times. I took that test three times. And I say that not because I'm I feel down on myself because I want to inspire you. I took it three times because I didn't want to give up. I wanted to go to college. You know, I wanted to, to push myself. It's who I am. I'm a poor kid from Africa. I was raised up hard. Um, all the cards that, was, that came out was supposed to stop me. I didn't. I worked really hard to get here. I'm still here. There's a lot of people that may not support you, 
and we all have them around us because they know your potential to be great. They know that they can feel the fire in you to be, to be more. And that may come across as a threat. So with that said, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still get things done, but recognize that and still um, light people's candles. I'll light up anyone that I can, try to be as positive as I can, you know, because sometimes you're really doing it for you. That's the first thing that it helps. The first person that helps is you when you give kindness to people, you know. It's you get a feeling of, you know what, like you paid your dues somehow, you know. So um, light up people's lives, be as positive as you can be, and, um, you know, just realize that there will always be obstacles, there will always be people who love you and people who don't like you. Um, focus on ones who care about you and grow that. Even if it's just a few. If everybody loves you, you're doing something wrong. Seriously, I mean, if you're doing something wrong. It is maybe a hard picture to look at where I've come from and where I've been able to get to. It is not something that happens on a regular basis. It took a lot of truth work and real work <laughs> and still a lot of work mm -hmm. to do what we do. But the reward is, is just seeing these people win their lives back, their confidence, they are new jobs, new relationships, they survive divorces, they survive marriages, um, they bounce back after ha having children, they get off medication for diabetes or arthritis or back pain or stress. These things are priceless, you know, so we are grateful that we've been able to provide that. I'm Molly Karam and I'm here to talk to you about Demario Soa, my trainer. Uh, I'm a host for TV show First Take here in Bristol, Connecticut at ESPN and I was looking for a trainer so I did some research and Demario has won just about every award. He's voted best trainer, uh, Hartford Magazine, the papers here year after year. So that's initially how I found him. And the other thing that stood out to me is Demario, even though he was local, he's garnered national media attention being on shows like The Doctors and being featured in books um, like Obsessed. So I felt like, okay, I'm getting this national level talent locally where I am. And the thing that we've been working on together is because I'm on camera and it doesn't do you any favors, I wanted to lose body fat. I wear a lot of dresses often and I wanted to tone up my arms and I wanted to streamline my waistline and I've taken three inches off my waist, I've taken two inches off my arms. And the thing that I love about him, not only is he easy to be around but can, you know continues to push me, but he's so creative with the workout. So it's always something different. It's always out of the box. Um, it's a lot of my own body weight and it's constantly challenging you and you're never getting bored. So I think um, in terms of why I would use strong fitness versus anything else is I think you're getting that big time level talent locally right here in Connecticut and, and I can't beat that. I want to get people to be able to do all the things that they always enjoy. So we take these things that you, you do as a child, which is you move, you play, you jump, you swing, you keep your athleticism, all those type of movements stimulate your neurological thinking and the freedom of your spirit. Um, it's really not gibberish. It really does affect you on a bigger scale. There's nothing that makes you feel more old than all of a sudden losing sense of balance or having different aches and pains that you did not experience before. You know, just you can, you can tell you know, body fat accumulating or maybe your high blood pressure or you know, all these medical anomalies that come with lack of movement, proper movement. So here we take those movements and we first see where you are as a person when you walk in through our doors. What's your medical history like? What is your past experience of trying to get in shape like? What is your current experience? Where are you? Are you a level one? which means you're pretty sedentary. Level two means you're more intermediate. Level three, you're more athletic. What do you look like in a soldier crawl or in a walkout? When you squat, does your knee hurt? Um, what does your push-up mechanics look like? How's your deltoids in that, in that setting? Um, 
What does your posture look like? Is there any distortions? Um, what do you look like going up and down the stairs? These are all the little, little things that, you know, you'd be surprised when you watch someone sit at the mall or just sit somewhere and watch people go up and down the stairs. You would see one movement but first before the person reaches the stairs. Now, this is for most people. And then you see a different movement when they get up the stairs. Most people will mask the inability to exhibit good posture on the stairs by using explosive movement to quickly get up there. Or maybe it's laziness, but how do you grocery shop? How do you read labels? Um, at what point is doing just what? Um, five to six bone meals a day, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner. But we really take the time to really see where you are and then start to tailor all these movements around your goals. You know, big biceps and triceps doesn't mean that the person is necessarily healthy. The, the mind, the new logical component, the physical component, and, and all of that has to really encompass on, on how to get the person where they need to get safely. And we want to make it fun while we do it. We definitely encourage people to come in and try it out because it's way outside of machines and the general concept of training of, with technology today. Don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for technology. You know, it's, I always say it's the reason why I'm able to even be able to stand here with my left fused ankle. But it has replaced some of the basic necessities of our body's needs to, to give us more longevity. I really became addicted to helping people be successful and seeing dramatic changes and even a lot of internal changes. You know, I realize there's so much more than just the Joe Fury who lost almost 100 pounds or the Diane Smith who lost um, 117 pounds in the New York Times bestseller obsessed. Um, or more and more, so many people that we've helped um, change lives in this community. I gotta give my man Demario credit. I've been coming to Strong Fitness for a few months. I know I may not look that good to y'all, but let me put it in perspective. I was about 15 pounds heavier. I was a skinny fat dude. I was, I was skinny, very little definition, pot belly, the whole bit. I start coming here, I lose about 14, 15 pounds. I gain some definition. In case y'all haven't noticed, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm not doing that bad to be almost 50, but guess what, I'm not satisfied. And that might be the greatest testimony I can give to DeMario because he's not only somebody that works me to death, makes me feel like crazy, like, oh my Lord, what am I doing? But he constantly keeps me wanting to come back because I'm a results-oriented dude. And every time I come here, I see progress. Imagine if I put in even more work, how good I would be. I'm actually in a little bit of shape right now. And I repeat, I'm almost 50. I got to give strong fitness to my man Demario love for that. Needless to say, I come here on a regular. And I'm actually proud of myself because he makes me want to put in the work. Running a business means you have to learn how to deal with relationships. And nothing about my past prepared me to deal with relationships. Growing up was survival, and survival means you do what you have to do to survive. That attitude doesn't work when you're trying to build a brand and you're trying to develop relationships. Dealing with customers, dealing with people, dealing with great people and you know, difficult people and staffing and hiring and growing and changing and rearranging. Any entrepreneur can understand that you cannot do what we do or what I do if you don't care about people. You, you wouldn't have been in business for long if you are a jerk to people. Well, I've never been overweight before, but I can relate to their pain in the sense of just my own pain. They may not process things the way that I do or see it, and it's okay. And I think that was one of the key points in my growth as a business owner. I had a, a bike accident motorcycle accident a few years back. I've had three surgeries on it. Um, so it bows, falls to the left. So I end up walking on my lateral hips, TFL, um, hamstring, glutes, all of those ends up getting really tight, very painful, extremely painful because the fusion did not heal. So I'm supposed to go back and get a refuse a fourth time to which I just, you know, it's hard. I, I don't want to do that at the moment. So myself and the medical team are looking at some other options of what we could do. Uh, we actually are looking to build me a shoe. Um, 
And um, yeah, and this is one of my clients that I work with. And um, once again, I'm lucky to have the type of clientele that can help me at these times of need. I do my best to bring that light that has kept me lit up to light up the world as much as I can. Thriving, so much more than surviving. It's really living, it's forgiving, it's accepting, then letting go. I'm letting go. believe in my future and I'm accepting my past and I have found the real me and I am free at best stamping my mark on earth on the road of life dancing with the wind now I know how it